Welcome back to the Weather Center, ladies and gentlemen. And yes, we are officially back. I have developed a new schedule, a new routine to shoot these videos and get them out on a regular basis. Today, we're going to be broad brushing over what it looks like could be occurring this upcoming weekend and early next week with a very expansive and potentially strong storm system that's going to jump jets from the polar front moving in over the western United States and then eventually transitioning through the southern tier U.S. associating itself with the subtropical jet or our El Nino jet. Before we get started, thank you very much for joining me today. Happy Monday, January 29th, 2024. We are three days away from my 30th birthday, and I'm really looking forward to that, especially if it does mean we get to do some storm chasing during my birthday weekend. But in the meantime, please like and share this video and hit that subscribe button if you are brand new to the channel and turn on those notifications because we will be pumping out routine updates and you don't want to miss those. All right, guys, let's fasten our seatbelts and get right in here. We're going to kick things off with our 1,000 to 500 thickness at the 500 millibar level courtesy of our zero z euro i do believe that this model specifically and this chart and the overlay does an excellent job of depicting what it is that's going to take place as we get into the back end of this week into this weekend as well as why my theory suggests it will move jets from the polar front as it troughs in over the extreme easternmost pacific and hits western conus before transitioning to our el nino subtropical jet through the gulf of mexico along the gulf coast line and eventually the northern if not central florida peninsula we're going to start the loop but about 48 hours out, you can see we do have a bit of an upper low perturbation over the Midwest, the Great Lakes, that will provide us with a little bit of additional snowfall, nothing too intense. This is mainly just going to be some breakaway energy from the polar front jet, thanks to our mid-amplitude ridge beginning to establish itself and strengthen into a sharp amplitude ridge over the Rocky Mountains and over the predominant western half of the lower 48, beginning to ridge into Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, as you can see here. As I take this loop through time, you can see that trough axis making its way towards the west coast, particularly over the pack northwest British Columbia. And notice as that dominant ridge begins to work its way into central Canada, the heart of the United States, we actually do see it become amplified enough to create an omega block. What's very interesting here is if you look at that trough over western Conus, it is very rapidly transitioning into a negative fashion or it's developing a negative tilt to it. And what's eventually going to happen is as that jet, the polar front, moves over top that blocking ridge, we're going to get some breakaway energy that's going to try to move beneath that ridge axis and it's going to turn into right about there a textbook rex block pattern where you have a breakaway anti-cyclone over the northern tier looks like it's centered directly over minnesota the upper great lakes and then we have that very strong cold pocket that you can see now scraping along that gulf coastline before it attaches itself to the subtropical jet and eventually gets reabsorbed into the pattern off the eastern united states coastline particularly the mid-atlantic region off of cape hatteras if we go ahead and move on over to our 1,000 to 500 thickness, but with the surface overlay on, you can see that storm system really begin to take shape as it moves into the southern plains. We kind of get a bit of a washing out effect, typical of when these systems transition through the Rocky Mountains, particularly through the four corners, the front range of Wyoming and Colorado, and especially if these systems do dig in as far south as the desert southwest, we will see the surface reflection of these upper level cyclones kind of wash out because of how much higher terrain there prevents it from really establishing itself in the low levels. But if I continue through time, there you have it. You have that cyclogenesis that occurs right about where we've seen it pretty textbook throughout this winter season. The Oklahoma and Texas panhandle kind of in between regimes, but in this case, because of that breakaway anti-cyclone we highlighted at 500 millibars, this system is going to shoot more east-southeast and head towards the Gulf Coastline, the southeast U.S., and eventually make landfall somewhere along the western coast of the Florida Peninsula, unless it does stay a bit further to the north. I've been seeing a lot of wiggling and wobbling run to run, and that's why we're not going to get too specific in terms of where these major impacts could be taking place. What we're going to see in terms of finite phenomena in your local area. We'll get to that as we get towards the back end of this week and we get closer. Right now, we're more or less bullseyeing what this large-scale, expansive cold pocket and low-pressure system could do. And as you take this a little bit further through time, this is going into Sunday afternoon, right around the lunchtime as everyone's leaving church on Sunday afternoon. You can see we're looking at widespread, heavy rainfall, high winds, definitely, and some localized severe weather for parts of Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, and especially the Florida Peninsula 
Peninsula beginning to dig into the southern periphery of Georgia. I do think if you guys look at how much intense thickness packing we have down there over the Gulf of Mexico, it isn't going to be as substantial as when we had that Arctic plunge earlier this month and we had that severe weather outbreak in the Gulf Coastline region as well as the Florida Panhandle with that Panama City EF2 tornado that worked its way through there. But we do have enough jet support, enough baroclinicity or temperature discontinuity associated with this system. We definitely have abundant wind shear to go around. And in fact, this may be a little bit more optimal for supercellular or at least multicellular thunderstorms to kick off, especially over Florida and into Georgia, Alabama, and maybe even further up into the Carolinas because we don't have as robust of an 800 and 700 millibar flow. We have seen very good wind shear in these previous systems, but believe it or not, I do believe we were above, if not exceeding, favorable shear thresholds for a lot of the supercellular activity or the severe weather activity we could have realized in Florida, especially during that one chase we went on many weeks ago when we started up in Tallahassee and worked our way back through central Florida. In my opinion, and this is my humble opinion, I do think because we have a moderate component at 850 millibars up to 700 before we finally start reaching into those very strong upper level winds in 500 and especially at the jet level 300 millibars, I do think this does favor a bit more of that rotational component to get some of these updrafts tilted, longer lasting, and rotating to produce funnel clouds if not very isolated weak tornadoes. Now we're going to move over to tropical tidbits because personally I actually prefer the GFS and the Canadian overlay on tropical tidbits. They're just a little bit easier to read as well as to pull up as opposed to weathermodels.com. I do love weather models for all of our ensemble products which we'll look at here in a moment but I do want to take you through the GFS. We're going to start off with the Zero Z with the hot model run just to show you guys that we are working in unison model to model in terms of what our Euro and our GFS models are thinking with this system. So as we begin to see that trough axes make landfall along the western coastline, you can already see that we have a very elongated trough slash cold frontal boundary thanks to our blocking ridge over interior conus. That's exactly what the model is showing here. This is not one individual storm system. Starting off in British Columbia through the pack northwest, the Great Basin of Idaho, the northern extent of Nevada, and then especially bringing in some good snowfall, higher terrain snow for the Sierras, good rainfall through interior California, all the way down into the desert southwest. And if you take this further in time, you can watch these very, very faint thickness lines. I know it may be hard for you guys to see that from where you're watching, but if you look at the way the thickness orients itself, you can see that breakaway energy right here beginning to flow through the desert southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, before we finally get a very powerful low cyclogenesis over Texas. This does look a little bit more like a Texas low as opposed to its European counterpart was thinking we would see it just a bit to the north. And this is exactly what I meant earlier, guys, with that wiggling and wobbling. We are still about five days away from the main event occurring in the southeast, but this is only 138 hours out, so these models are only going to continue to get more and more reliable as we get closer to game time. As you continue through the loop, you can see a very, very powerful line of very heavy rainfall and shower activity beginning to dissociate itself with the upper low center here that does look to want to go barotropic or become more uniform in its temperature discontinuity and become cold core, relatively cold core in nature. As you can see, we actually have very high thickness values attached to this system, which could actually be a limitation in terms of how much severe weather we get out of this. This could possibly just be more of a high wind, heavy rainmaker for folks along the Gulf Coast and the Gulf Coast states and Florida. Florida specifically. Regardless of the severe weather threat, that's going to be the main emphasis of this video for sure, guys. Right now, looking at a 994 millibar low approaching that 990 threshold over Texas, Louisiana, we are definitely going to see some very sporty, non-convective, or gradient-associated winds off of this system with a lot of rainfall for areas who just received a lot of flooding rains previous to this week. Last week, thanks to that training scenario we had occurring over Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi. So, Brace yourselves for another round, and it does look like Florida is definitely going to be on the receiving end this time after we dodged the bullet last week. If I switch over to the Canadian model, you see the Canadian model is right in sync with the GFS and the Euro, kind of bumping that low center pressure a little bit further to the north and a little bit higher than what the GFS is anticipating, coming in at around 996 millibars. Again, still going to be a high wind threat, very gusty conditions as you get closer to that low center of circulation, and the frontal axes on this system, or this solution, I should say, on the Canadian model does look a little bit more elongated. We could potentially see some more embedded severe thunderstorms associated with this, depending on how much cold air does stay nestled into the center of the low. 
And then the last but not least, we're going to come over to the German model, the Icon. I will admit I've been neglecting this model a little bit ever since we left the tropical season. But you can see as you look into what the model is thinking here, this is definitely once again singing in tune with the rest of our model platforms, the Canadian, the GFS, and the European model alike. With a 992 millibar low as of February 4th, this is Sunday early morning, parked off the Mississippi-Alabama coast with some very good thunderstorms and heavy rainfall associated with it as it approaches the west coast of Florida. So all in all, we'll get ready to start wrapping up this video. I'll take you very briefly through the ensembles to show you that the GFS, the Euro, and the Canadian model are still in consistency with one another. However, we're going to stay away from looking at very, very fine parameters, looking at a detailed extent of what we could possibly see with this system. Just because we are still over 100 hours out, five to six days away from when we could start seeing some very frivolous impacts down over the southeast. You're definitely going to see some good winds, some very high amounts of upper terrain snowfall out over the west especially the Four Corners area as that negatively tilted trough comes through. And we'll be tracking that as we move through time with maybe a potential downsloping event along the Lee of the Cascades and the Lee of the Sierra Nevadas with that trough in the upper level jet sinking its way through that area. What I'll definitely be monitoring here in the Weather Center is exactly when that anti-cyclone or that sharp amplitude blocking ridge can establish itself over interior Conus and up into Canada because that's truly going to dictate where this low develops and where it tracks. Now before we close out the video, here are our ensembles this is going to be our 6Z GFS ensembles. They're really going to remain much of the same. I've been watching this for the last three days now, and our ensembles and our deterministic models have not deviated too much. So we'll go ahead and fall back on this continuity run just to show you guys what the big picture idea is with this setup. And as you track it through time, you can see a lot of our ensemble agreement does suggest the core of this low pressure is going to pass somewhere within the Big Bend area and maybe exit off the coastline of Daytona between Jacksonville of Florida. If you switch over to the European model and stay on the exact same same time frame or the same time stamp, you can see the European model is thinking almost exactly the same as what our GFS ensembles with very good member agreement that we will have an upper low and a low pressure center established at the surface moving just off the space coast of Florida. So very little wiggling and wobbling going on with our ensembles, but we are starting to see them become more concise as we go through time. And I definitely do think by Wednesday, if not my birthday on Thursday, we will have a very good idea of what's exactly going to shake out for a lot of us. Finally, last but not least, before we close out, I'm switching over to our Canadian ensembles, and you can see, again, we are very, very in tune with one another, the GFS, the Euro, and the Canadian model, and I left it on the exact same timestamp just so I could show you guys that good model-to-model -model and run-to-run -run consistency. We're looking at very similar pressure values as well as a very, very similar location of where this low could be as we get into Monday morning, February 5th, after everything has settled down and we're on the backside of this system, maybe still receiving some onshore flow over the Carolinas, the Mid-Atlantic, Atlantic region with some residual shower activity in Florida and Georgia. So that'll do it guys. We're going to wrap up the video now. Like I said, we'll wait until we get a little bit closer to start digesting exactly what our run to run hour by hour impacts could look like. But regardless, we definitely want to watch this because this is going to be a regional multi-state high wind and heavy rain event. So we will likely see those flood advisories and flood warnings come back as this system approaches. We will likely see very, very heavy snow totals piling up over the four corners, especially over the higher terrain features of the Rocky Mountains, particularly the Cascades, the Sierra Nevadas further to the west of the Four Corners area, the Mogollon Rim of Arizona into New Mexico, and then the Front Range of Colorado as well with that cold plunge in the negatively tilted trough at 300 millibars. SPC has given us a low end threat for severe, and I personally think they may be under forecasting probably because we are still so far away from this event. This would be probably highlighted on a day seven or a day eight chart if Storm Prediction Center were to target this on their charts this far in advance. So I do think, again, Wednesday and Thursday, I do believe if we don't see anything highlighted on SPC's charts, it's probably because our models have really backed off on this intensity. But I definitely do think, regardless, we're going to see very good non-convective winds, very heavy rainfall, and I think the environment is very conducive to seeing a localized funnel cloud or two, if not a full-on tornado touchdown, especially as you get on the leading edge where our cape and our warm sector could really establish itself along the leading edge of this upper low and surface-based reflection. Hope to see you tonight at our 8 p.m. live. We'll definitely dig into the details just a little bit more for entertainment's sake to kind of get a preliminary look of what our models are thinking. But until, guys, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. And once again, please like and share this content and subscribe because we are going to get back into the routine of pumping out this regularly scheduled content as promised. But until then, we'll talk to you soon. This is Weather Center Nazario signing out.